series on uh, celebrating Christ, the Son of the Living God. Obviously, we had uh, Celebrate the King event on uh, Friday, and it was a huge success. Let's give the Lord a big hand, big hand of praise. It is a good thing to celebrate Christ. And um, those of you that were here on the day, I declared as God laid on my heart for our 2022 to be our covenant season of uh, divine fruitfulness. Let's give the Lord a big hand one more time. <laughs> These titles don't just come because we want words that will make us happy. It takes time. I pray. I look. A, a few things, I must admit, a few things drop in my spirit, man, from time to time as the year goes on. And uh, the thing for 2023 has already dropped, but I pray and watch and pray. And then as it goes on, he ships it and finally it comes up with what it is. Every one of us will agree that we have encountered supernatural overflow as people throughout this session, this, this season, this year. Everyone will have testimonies. There are things I can, I can mention here that I know personally in my life and in the lives of some of you that have testified that those things were nothing but this supernatural overflow that God promised us. So I want us to continue to be encouraged in those words, never giving up. Hallelujah. The title, therefore, of the final session is Empowerment for Fruitfulness. Just to tide us into what God is about to do from Friday night to Saturday when we will meet here to cross into the new year and also for when we are able to uh, go into the season properly from Sunday next week. That is in terms of our Sunday messages. So this title is Empowerment for Fruitfulness. And again, we are reading the last two chapters of John, John chapter 20 and John chapter 21, wherein we are going to be taking six truths again, as we normally would do. And I know that our time has kind of been a bit far spent today, but let's trust God to help us to make the most of what time we have left. In John chapter 20, Pastor Lola led us earlier on to read the first 18 verses in our um, Bible reading. And I just want to say the first truth comes from there. Hallelujah. This was after Jesus' resurrection. Do we need help with the sound? This was after Jesus' resurrection. And um, the Bible says that Mary went to the tomb to look for her, to look for him. And you know the story? In verse 9, the Bible says they did not yet know that he was to rise. They did not yet know the scripture that said he would rise. That is so important. It shows that our encounters with God and our understanding of the doings of God is so much tied to the scriptures we know. They did not yet know. So she was looking. Luke said, why, Luke's account, he said, the angel said to her, why are you seeking the living among the dead. She was going to embalm and, and continue to prepare the body of a dead person because she did not yet know the scripture that said it would rise. And this was very important for me. So the first thing we must realize is when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose and he gave them eternal comfort. He gave them eternal comfort. So our first truth here is that his resurrection is our eternal comfort. His resurrection, every time we think about his resurrection, we must continue to know that it is our eternal comfort. And I'll read from verse 13, John chapter 20. Then they said to her, these were the people taking care of the, of the, of the, the garden where the, he was buried. They said, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she has said this, I, I need this sound improved. Where is Toby, please? It's going all over the place. Thank you. He said, now, when she has said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. She did not know that it was Jesus. How many of us do not know the appearance of God in the manifestation of his word? Do you know that certain things that you are passing through at times, 
is an indication of his appearance in your life to fulfill something. But when we do not know, we limit our experience. This is why the Bible says, you know the truth. It sets you free. She did not know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to her, verse 15, he said, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. <laughs> if you had carried him away, tell, him where, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And verse 16, everybody, let's read verse 16 together. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. At that point, she recognized Jesus Christ. Then verse 17, Jesus said, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and my God and your God. If you go back to verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary, Jesus said to her, Mary, Jesus did not first start by saying, I am he. Jesus called her. In Isaiah 43, verse 1, the Bible says, fear not, for I have redeemed you and have called you by name. Jesus personalizes his relationship with us so that we can recognize him. We have a duty and a responsibility to learn of him, to learn. He said, my sheep hear my voice because they know me. We have a duty to develop our relationship with Christ, to know him, to hear him. When Je she did not know Jesus before that time, she thought he was a gardener. But when Jesus said, Mary, when she said, Mary, she replied, Rabboni. When she, when she heard the voice of him whom he knew, she knew before. And I want us to understand that this is how our spiritual journey can be made much simpler when we take time to fellowship with him personally, develop that intimacy that allows you to know when he says David, when he calls your first name and he calls you as a person. He said he has redeemed you. He has called you by name and you are his. When he calls you by name, you also should be able to answer Rabboni. You also should be able to know when God is speaking to you. You also should be able to know that Jesus is the one that is speaking to you right now. This was the difference for Mary. Before that point, she was saying, she was thinking it was the gardener. Then Jesus said to her in verse 17, he said, do not cling to me because I have not yet gone to the Father, which reassures and comforts her. If you remember in John chapter 14, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. He said, if it were not so, I would not have told you so, but I go there to prepare a place for you. He had said those words before he went to the cross. Now that he has gone to the cross and he has now resurrected, he said to Mary again, he said, don't cling to me. I am going to fulfill what I have told you before. I remain your resurrection hope. I remain your hope for eternity. I remain your hope as long as you are in this world now. I am going to the Father like I have said to prepare a place for you. He said, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. In John 14, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now, he said, I am going to my father and your father. The resurrection is not just about a man dying and rising again. It is about a man who died and rose again, the son of the living God. And by reason of his resurrection, conferred unto us the power for sonship as well. He said, my father and your father, my God and your God. So that we can continually be eternally hopeful. Every Christian that loses sight of this has a potential to backslide. Every Christian that loses sight of the fact that Jesus' father is our father. Jesus' God is our God. And he has gone there to prepare a place for us where he is. He said, for where I am, there you will be also. That that person... Uh, you and I have become those persons that have been called into the fold simply means we have no reason to give up on our Christian race. The Bible says it is Christ that is in us that must continue to be that hope of glory. And I pray that God will revitalize your spiritual journey from this day. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. He's our eternal comfort. When we think about him, we should be comforted. Number two, I go to John chapter 20 from verse 21. This is the fact that he commissions us in his peace 
and the power of the Holy Spirit. He commissions us in his peace and the power of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 2, verse 20. John chapter 20, verse 21, sorry. He said, Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Our commissioning to go forth is not just because we have become a people that he has given a task without us being able to go forth in it. He first gave us his peace. The peace of God is Jesus Christ personified that now causes us to have the relationship that was severed with the Father. Man had a perfect relationship with God in the Garden of Eden. When man fell, that relationship became severed. We know the story very well. And for several, year, for several years, man had to depend on the principle of atonement through sacrifice of bulls, goats, rams, even turtle doves, depending on the size of the person financially, and so on. They had to depend on those sacrifices. But when Jesus came, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 says, He himself became our peace. And he has made all one, he has made both one and broken down that middle wall of separation. That only those who were qualified as high priests could go beyond to get to the Father on our behalf. Oh, what a privilege it is. The Bible says he became our peace. He said, that freedom is what I live with you. Go to verse 15. He said, and having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances that we had to go there, appease through the high priest and bring bulls, bring grams, bring goats and those kind of animals. He said, now he created in himself one new man from the two. He created one new man from the two. As the son of God and the son of man, he created one new man who became our peace and gave us access to the father directly. Hallelujah. He is our peace. Say, he is my peace. And verse 16 says, and he that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross whereby put into death that enmity. Verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him, verse 18, we both have access. Let's read verse 18 together. Everybody loud and clear. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Through him, we have access. This is why when we pray, we must be people who are praying with the knowledge of the fact that we have access to the Father. We are not beggars before the Father. We are people who have access to the Father. If you have a biological child and what you find from them is that they come to you every day looking like beggars, looking like somebody who do not know that they have access to everything that you can provide as a father or as a mother, you will be very, very disturbed. This is how God expects us to be bold. He gave us his son so that we can have access. Never be convinced again that you don't have access to the Father. You have access to the Father. And I know I make this emphasis a lot. It's just because in the recent time, the body of Christ have grown through a culture whereby they think they have to pray through a person. They think they have to pray through a leader. They have to pray through a pastor. They have to pray through certain brethren in the church. Now, while I am not against meeting the brethren for intercession and prayers of agreement and joining of faith, everything has its place or praying for one another and interceding for one another. My main emphasis is the fact that every one child of God has access, direct access to the Father. What you need to take to the Father per time, take it to him without hindrance. Hallelujah. Go back to John chapter 20, verse 22. And when he has said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. John chapter 20, verse 22 now. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. What is important here is for us to realize that the Holy Spirit is given when we are a people who are walking in the peace of God that has been given to us, that gives us freedom and access to the Father. The Holy Spirit now becomes that who we can relate and do the commissioning that he has put in our hands. The work of the Christian is a work of faith. It's a walk that gives us access to the Father but releases us from the presence of the Father to continue to reconcile men unto the Father. He breathed on them, verse 22, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 23. He said, for if you forgive, and of course we know in the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in many places, in Acts 13, 1, for example, he commissions Barnabas and Saul and he said, separate unto me the Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. Separate Barnabas and Saul unto me. 
It is important we understand that the Holy Spirit is the one who commissions us. And when we are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can't be discouraged, we can't be down. When you find your Christian life dwindling and lacking strength, lacking energy, and you find yourself unable to do the things of God, you need to say, Holy Spirit, help me. Listen, friends, everybody gets tired. Did you read in the Bible that Jesus got tired? Did you read in the Bible that Jesus got hungry? As long as you are in this physical body, you will get tired from time to time. So nobody must pretend that they are super, super humans. Don't pretend it. <laughs> Don't try it. But always realize that your, the Bible says he helps our infirmities. Romans chapter 8 verse 26. He helps our infirmities that even the times we don't even know how to pray, he prays for us. He is ready to do those things. Pray for us, stand with us, empower us, strengthen us. So when Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit, what he's saying is that if you are going forward to be my disciples and those that will now be people I have commissioned to fruitfulness, you need to know how to walk in the Holy Spirit. Verse 23 now, John 20, 23. He said, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. But if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. These are some scriptures that some Christians have read now to think that they have power to, to, to make people remain as sinners. No. It didn't say that because if you don't forgive them, they are retained. It means that you now say, okay, I will not forgive this one so that their sins can stay with them. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, if you forgive, let's read it now. John 20, verse 23. Can I have it up? He said, if you forgive, read it with me, please, everybody. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. What that means is much more about you, not about the persons you did not forgive. How do I know this? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, he said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So if you forgive, the sins are forgiven. That means you too are now an object of mercy. You have shown mercy, you too can now receive mercy. How many of us pray Hebrews 4, 16? Let us come boldly before the throne of grace that we find grace and do what? Obtain mercy. Don't go and do it if you don't forgive people. <laughs> you get my point now? If you don't forgive people, don't go and say, here I come boldly. You are not bold nothing. <laughs> you are full of unforgiveness. The, the, the access to mercy is to be merciful. The access to receiving, obtaining mercy is to be merciful. You hold everybody in your heart. Nobody is ever free. This one that did that, that one did that, this one did that. Every time you don't find a place for mercy, you will block mercy from your own life. I am quick to release mercy because I want to quickly get mercy when I need it. If you want a smooth flow of mercy into your life, be one who forgives. Be like one of my mentors who said very boldly that he has learned how to forgive people before. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> he said before they offend him, he has forgiven. It's wonderful. <laughs> so he has credit card of forgiveness. <laughs> he has credit card of forgiveness. So when you are bringing your sin to him, he, by the time you are committing the sin, you are already forgiven. <laughs> I like that. Before. Why? Because you want to keep obtaining mercy. You must be a person that is quick to release mercy. Jesus said, if you forgive them, that sin is forgiven. But if you retain it, it means it's retained. And that means also you are retaining your own, you are blocking your own mercy from the one who should be merciful to you. And who betide a man who goes around this world without God's mercy? The devil will so batter that person because it is the mercy of God that triumphs over judgment. Did you hear that before in your Bible? It is the mercy of God that triumphs over judgment. So when you make a mistake or you take a wrong step, judgment says die now. Mercy says ah, 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 ah. You can't because that one has forgiven. They have opened the door for mercy and right now I'm protecting them that judgment will not triumph. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Hallelujah. You want to see God's mercy all the time? Be a merciful person. This is very important. Your life will never remain the same. 
Even in workplace, I have found that the more I forgive subordinates and people who respond to me, the more I, 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 have, I show mercy in their errors, the more people that I am responsible to show me mercy as well. It's a very simple principle. Some people don't know. Life is hard for some people because they are not showing enough mercy. When you show mercy, you find that life is easier. As you are releasing it, God is releasing it your way. As you are releasing it, God is releasing it your way. Somebody bungles up a business idea with you, and then you, you talk as if it is the end of the world. It did not, yes, you lost some money, you lost some time, but it's not the end of the world. And you now talk as if, you know, they, 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 they have committed an unpardonable sin. Say, I will never do business with you again. You are useless, you are this, you are that. You call them all kinds of names. The day you do this simplest <laughs> mistake, you will see the whole thing heaped on you again. It's not a curse. But if you say, you know, this is not the best position for us to be. Now we have had this issue. We need to deal with it. We hope it doesn't happen again. And of course, yes, you don't have to give them that task again if you feel they are not competent to do it. That's fine. But you resolve it in such a way that there is mercy all around the correction and the rebuke and everything. There is mercy around it. That is the same way the day you gaff, <laughs> that God will make sure that you are shown mercy as well. I told you how my father... Many years ago, my father who has gone to be with the Lord in glory, I used to record for him. I used to take tape recorders and go around all the schools he used to preach in northern Nigeria. And um, my, my, my dad would, would speak to many of those young children. And, uh, you know, one day I recorded something. I thought that it was, this was the very olden days in the late 70s where we had those tape recorders that you had to physically press some buttons to, to record on a tape. And, uh, you know... I'm just trying to describe it because some of the youngsters here would not just get what I'm talking about, so I won't go into details. But if you don't do it well, it doesn't record, or if the tape itself is faulty, it will not record. So I used to record it for him, and then the first thing he does when we get back into the car, I'll be sat at the back with all the tapes and all the other things, and then he will say, play it back, and I'll play it. And then I used to watch him from the back seat, and he'll be listening to himself, and he'll be going, mm, mm. I never forgot that. <laughs> he'll be hearing himself, and he'll say, mm, that's true, yeah. You know? So I knew they meant a lot to him, so I used to take it seriously, because it's like he, he's a teacher, he was a teacher, he was a lecturer, so it was like a reflective practice for him, because he tends to learn from it, and, you know, to the next school, and he does the thing again. Anyway, so this one day, I did the same things I normally did, record, play, play and record, set it right, after 40 minutes or so of his speaking, we went back into the car. As soon as we got, he said, David, play me the tape. As I put it on with confidence as I normally do, the thing didn't play anything. I was sweating. I was sweating. I rewound it, played it, fast forwarded it, maybe it started somewhere else, nothing. The thing was just rolling. <laughs> no sound was coming out. And then he looked back, he looked in the rear mirror and he saw me. He said, what's wrong with you? He saw I was sweating already because I thought I would get the greatest blocking of my life because <laughs> I know how much those things meant to him. And he looked back at me and he, he said, what's wrong? I said, I don't know what happened. And he said, hey, take it easy. He said, maybe it's something to do with the tape. He said, fast forward it. I did. Fast forward it again. He said, hmm, that's strange. He didn't record. Okay, that's fine. Next time. That was the time I breathed <laughs> a sigh of relief. But you know something, that one singular act, because I know those things meant a lot to him. Till today, I still remember it. When there is a problem with our sound people and things that would want to make me real, I remember that act of mercy that I was shown. The worst of man in this, on this planet is one who doesn't remember mercy shown when he should show mercy. They are the biggest dictators of this, plan, of this earth, and we must not be one of them in Jesus' name. Number three, he blesses our faith. The third point in John chapter 20, he blesses our faith in him. John 20 verse 27, then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it to my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. You know that point? Thomas said, unless this is Mary had gone, told John, told Peter, everybody has heard about it. Thomas came on the scene and said, what are you guys talking about? Unless I see the hand. Not just see, 
put my finger into it to be sure a hole is there. So that it's not that they painted something and say that is the, that is the one. <laughs> he said, unless I look, reach your finger and look at my hands and reach your hands there and put it to my side. He said, do not be unbelieving. Tell your neighbor for me, do not be unbelieving. I know you are a believer. Say to them, I know you are a believer. But do not be unbelieving. That means that there are unbelieving believers. I don't know, it's a complex thing, but it, that means that Thomas was supposed to be a believer following Christ, isn't he? So then Jesus said, do not be unbelieving. So that means a believer can become unbelieving. When we say unbeliever, people think somebody who has never given their life to Christ. No, a person who was following Christ, eating with Christ, knowing Christ physically, was still told not to be unbelieving. So every one of us must be very careful that we don't become unbelieving. Say, so do not be unbelieving or believing. And then, verse 28, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Let's read verse 29 together. This is the biggest thing we need to learn about this truth of Christ to us. Let's read verse 29. Everybody go. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Somebody say with me, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Your blessing is tied to your faith. He blesses your faith. He said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I make this emphasis again today because, again, we're a generation that is so evidence-based. As a matter of fact, in every teaching we teach now in higher institution, they will tell you that you have to teach evidence-based teaching. When we were taught mathematics, I did not need evidence to know Pythagoras' law. <laughs> I believe, <laughs> I believe as I was taught that this is the hypotenuse, this is the opposite, and this is adjacent. I don't need any evidence. Now you have to take a pizza and cut it <laughs> and show the class evidence of how this is opposite. Ah, no. We are a generation that is so laden with a need for proof. We have mixed scientific things with spiritual things. Yes, in science, we validate theories by proofs. But in the spirit, we get proofs after faith validating the theory. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. He said, and this sign shall follow those who do what? Not that they will believe first. Not that they will see signs first and believe. He didn't say these people shall see signs first and believe. He said these signs shall follow those who believe. That's why Jesus said, blessed are those who have not yet seen, but yet they have believed. If your faith is based on you seeing a miracle performed before you believe, you are an unbeliever. You must be somebody who believes the word as it is. The centurion says, speak the word only. I don't need any other thing. Speak the word only. I know that signs follow the word. I know that signs follow faith in the world. He says, speak the word only. I am trusting God that this church and as many churches who are catching this fire, we come back to the place where believers are simply like children when it comes to the word of God. Now, I understand that the apprehension and the fear has been in the place where the devil has taken advantage and have done a lot of manipulation and people don't just ship, should not just sheepishly follow things. That is true. But that is why you have the spirit of God in you. You have the spirit of God to check which is from God and which is not of God. When it's not of God, don't believe. Don't believe. If somebody comes to you now and says, shh, 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 I prophesy. Right, hear me? 2,000 today, before the end of the service. <laughs> you are dropping it, not that you are receiving. <laughs> before the end of the service, then by next week, it's 20,000, 20,000, 20,000, 20,000. <laughs> and then you look for somebody else and say, ah, Brother Gosbauer, you own 5,000, the way you are sat down. 
Don't believe that kind of thing. That is the thing that many people have now said they are not believing. But you see, when the word of God is coming your way and somebody, somebody, somebody expounds the word and you can see the light in it and he says, this is all you need to do. Believe me in this matter. I am able to do this. Just apply your faith. Don't say, I am waiting until I see a miracle. I am waiting until I see something. Do you know that when you believe, you become a living miracle? You become a living miracle. You no longer look for miracles. Your life itself becomes a miracle. I tell you, I say your life will become a miracle. Because you will now find that the more you are believing, the more. That is why when they came to him in John chapter 6, and he gave them bread to eat. Remember they were following him the next day? Remember Jesus Christ? He said, I know that you have come again today, not because you believe me that much, but because of what? You ate bread yesterday. Many people are like that. When they ate bread, they felt, this man, this guy, let's go, man. As long as we are with this guy, you will have bread and fish every day <laughs> without paying anything. That is human nature. Jesus said that is for laboring for meat that what perishes. They don't labor for that. Labor for spiritual substance that will keep you. My word, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. When you believe those, they produce bread, they produce other things in your emotions, they produce other things for you spiritually. They produce for you in every way. I was, when we were praying, I was sharing my testimony the last, in the summer, when my father went to be in, with the Lord and we had to bury him. Now, of course, if you have 80-year-old parents, it is advisable to have saved money. Am I speaking here? It is advisable. Don't say, don't, don't be fitting it. Then you say it happens suddenly. No. <laughs> the woman and the man is 80. You need to be preparing. Not because you are wishing them dead. It's just common sense. <laughs> so from time to time, you put something aside. And the truth is, I'd save some money. In Nigerian Naira, millions. Some few millions. I've saved something because I know that the day that man lives here, it's not a two million naira affair <laughs> in Nigerian naira because of the kind of person he was. Hallelujah. So I know it will be serious business, but you know, you can only save so much. So I put a few millions here and there. But when we started the thing, I now found that it was not about what I saved. Of course, I started spending from what I saved, but then suddenly I found miraculous ways God bringing money. God bringing money. Now the truth is, as people would do in our cultures, the people give money and but honestly, that was a fraction of what we spent. It was a fraction. God now started bringing some ideas into my way. Some, some of my business partners that have not been in touch with me for two years, three years, they would say, David, I have this thing for you. I'll say, look, I don't have time. I'm about to go and bury my father. They say, no, we have done it. All we just need for you to do is to look at it for us and this. I say, look, I'm going to charge you for this because it's so much time. I will charge you this amount. They say, we will pay. Huh? When I, saw that that's what <laughs> when I saw that that was what was happening, I stopped arguing with them. Before I knew it, money here, men, some people were paying and putting money in my account in Nigeria. And all kinds of things. And that is how I saw, the, again, the miracles of the five loaves and two fish in action. Where when you have something little and you just trust God, you just trust God. I say you trust God. He now begins to meet you at the point of your need. I say he will keep meeting you at the point of your need. In the name of Jesus. And honestly, friends, like I said to you, the passing of my father brought me into a new phase of life altogether. I celebrated his life. I celebrated him. Everybody around me knew that you cannot celebrate more than this unless you have more capacity than this. If I could go to CNN, I would go there and talk about him. <laughs> if I had that kind of money, he was that kind of an influence of my life. The day I came back to this country, after we have done all the burial and everything, my wife and I landed in Heathrow. The first text that got to my phone was about this new job that God now gave to me as an interview to come and attend. Hallelujah. So everything showed that not only was he a man of God, but that God was committed to those who serve him. Hallelujah. Everywhere I went, when I went home, I kept on saying, my father did not leave estates for me. In fact, the house he was living in, by the grace of God, we built it for him. But the truth is, I said he gave me Jesus Christ. And this Jesus has always given me everything. Everybody that came around, this was all I said to them about this man. And as I kept on seeking the kingdom of God, I found, when I got that text message, I told my wife, I said, truly, you know that the way the, the Roman soldier said, truly this man was a, he was a child or son of God. Remember that soldier? 
Eh? When after the, the place became that, he said, this, truly, this was the son of God. I said to myself, I said, truly, this man loved the Lord. Truly, this man was a, sign, uh, was a son of God because all the signs showed me. Friends, Amen. this is real. I said, this is real. Amen. Please don't be afraid. If you have aged parents, I'm not saying that you should go and panic yourself now and start putting, do whatever you can do and leave the rest to God. Hallelujah. Amen. And don't do more than yourself. If they tell you five cows, you can tell them, we don't do more than two where I come from. <laughs> Use some sense. Hallelujah. So he blesses our faith. He blesses our faith in him. Number four, he empowers us for physical fruitfulness. He empowers us for physical fruitfulness. This was one of the most interesting aspects of the conversation after Jesus rose. And the great apostle Peter could not even recognize him. He was fishing. Remember? He said to them, let's go fishing. And all the brothers followed him. This was after Peter, a few days before that time, Peter had just denied him to say, I don't know him. So Peter was in what we would call a kind of a backsliding state. But Jesus still went for him. And the Bible says in John, John chapter 21, verse 6. And he said, verse 5, Jesus said to them, verse 5, sorry, verse 5. Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? He knows that they have been toiling like he saw them. Remember Luke 5? When he first saw Peter, what was he doing? We have toiled day and night and caught nothing. Remember? That was his story. Jesus knew that Peter was back at that same spot again. Where there was no spirituality, no connection to him, as it were. He was still toiling again. Look at the conversation. Verse 6. He said to them, do what? Cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it because of the multitude of fish. Somebody say second time. Say second chance. Second time. Second chance. You would have expected Jesus to look at Peter after catching that second fish and say to him, you know what? You are very useless. This was how I, I, I helped you to catch the first time. By now you should have known that you can't do it without me. And here you are toiling again. No, Jesus didn't say that. Then the disciple, John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And Peter, the Bible says, I'm just cutting the story now. He was half naked, but he didn't even bother. He just flew into the water and swam towards the shore. And virtually, you know, everything repeated itself again like it was in Luke 5. But the Bible says in verse 9, then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals of, uh, there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have caught. I'm reading verse 11 now. In fact, verse 12. Okay. Okay, 11, that's fine. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of large fish. Somebody say full of large fish. This is evidence of physical fruitfulness. Evidence of physical fruitfulness. I want you to know that God never leaves a person he commissions to serve him without this same evidence. The day I found the scripture in Luke chapter 10, when he sent them out, and the Bible says, when I sent you out, did you lack, nothing? Did you lack anything? And they came and they said nothing. I found that every one child of God, sent of God in the mystery of reconciliation, every church sent to do and carry out a mission and carry out a vision for God will never lack anything. I say you will never lack anything. I did not say you will have everything, but you will never lack anything. Because some of the things that make up the everything that you think you should have are simply wants. But as long as they are need, the Bible says he will supply all your need according to his riches in glory. Everyone must be rest assured in this, that God will continue to give us the resources and the substance we need to serve him. In the name of Jesus. Many times I ask myself, I say, Lord, I am so grateful for you commissioning me to do this work. But at the same time, much more, I am grateful that you have empowered my hands to be able to do it. I know how much goes out of my hands alone, not my wife, not my children. I know how much goes out of my hand on a weekly basis into this work to the glory of my God. Both for the physical work and to the brethren, to the glory of my God. I'm not boasting here. But the day he called me and he told me that you will never lack and I simply believe he took my life to another level. This is how I want you to believe him come 2022. 
I say God will surprise you. With the physical evidence of fish like he did for Peter. He will surprise you. In the name of Jesus. Just be waiting to hear where he is asking you to cast the net. He said to Peter, cast your net to the right side. It's very specific. You have been toiling all night. Casting it to the left. Or casting it to the right at the wrong time. And all kinds of things. And it is a struggle and a struggle and a struggle. Don't carry it into 2022. No, don't carry that struggle into 2022. Make up your mind that this year is the last time. I say it's the last time you will struggle with the doings of the things of God. In the name of Jesus. Jesus said to him, cast it. And then later, verse 12, he said, come and have breakfast. <laughs> come and have breakfast. Is that not interesting? After providing the fish for them, he even provi provided the meal. That's why the psalmist said, you prepare a table before me. He will prepare a table before you. Amen. I say he will prepare a table before you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. In verse 13, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them. And likewise, the fish. Many times. A repeat again of John chapter 6. There's no food for anyone. He said, this is the little they have. He took it, broke it. And they ate, everybody ate to capacity. Twelve baskets were full after. Don't doubt God anymore. Tell your neighbor for me, don't doubt God anymore. Say, I know you believe him, but there are certain things that may make you doubt. Are you looking at your neighbor or the ceiling? Look at your neighbor. Say, but whatever you do, please, don't doubt God for anything. Don't be anxious for anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to him. Now say, for I know. Open your mouth now. Open your hands now and do it like this. Say, for I know that all things will work together for my good and I'll move forward. I know that all things will work together for my good and I'm moving forward in Jesus name you will be at the right place at the right time you will reply to the right email before you delete not every email that you see is a spam or a fraudulent email you know you just see something that you don't know where it has come from the first thing you do is I delete don't always delete read it first let the Holy Spirit show you. If they say you won 5 million euro, if you go and follow it, that one is your business. <laughs> one of our pastor mentors, he said, they told him that he won 5 million. He said, he decided that he would take them on this time. So he replied to those people who said, this is fantastic, you have made my day. <laughs> they said, ah, they thought they had caught somebody. They said, you know what, we need, to, we need processing fee to get the money out for you. And the processing fee is 50000 That if you can just raise it within the next two weeks, the five million will be in your account. Give us your bank details. We will process it. The man said, only 50000 He said, yes, 50000 He said, I permit you to take two million <laughs> from the money that you are going to release to me. <laughs> he said, take two million and give me the remaining three. That is good enough for me. In fact, if you want to take more, take more. Just... <laughs> Then they replied in this stupid man. <laughs> so you need the Holy Spirit to let you know. But I've received some emails. <laughs> I've received some emails. I was about to delete. Then I read it. Then I found out, no, this is an invitation from South Africa to do something. This is an invitation from Germany to do something. I don't know who these people are. And then I write, I reply to them. Then they say, yes, we found your details from so-so-so person and blah, 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 blah. This is what you, we need you to do. And I'm surprised that just simply like that, the first external examination I will do outside the country as a, as a, as a, as a, 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 a doctoral uh, exam, VIVA, I will call it, came like that in the year 2013. We had just started this church. The lady just wrote me. She said, I found your name on the internet, and this is what you do, this is my thesis, I would like you to come to Spain and be my external examiner. Just like that. 
most of the time, such things get recommended by people. People who know you will suggest to them, especially if they are supervisors. So I learned from such simple things that there is nothing, and from that one, I've done many other countries, you know, across the world, Trinidad, South Africa, Italy, like that, like that, like that. Hallelujah. The things that people struggle for, you will not struggle. Because God will show you physical evidence of fruitfulness. Not just fruitfulness in your body or fruitfulness spiritually. God will show you tangible, physical fruitfulness. The way it was shown to Peter and James and John with the fish. So it is that you will experience this physical fruitfulness in the name of Jesus. Number five, very quickly, because you are walking in the power of this fruitfulness, he also empowers us for obedience. I'll quickly read John, 15, John 21 verse 18. Go to verse 18. Verse 18, thank you. Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you guarded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will guard you and carry you where you do not wish. Jesus started to tell Peter about the difficulties that was ahead. Having said all this to you as fruitfulness and God empowering, God doing things, I must tell you the Christian race is not a journey of ease. It's not a journey of laxity. It's a journey of warfare. The only difference is that it is not by power, it's not by might, but by his spirit. You will be confronted with challenges. You will be tempted from time to time to be in despair. You will be tempted to feel that you, you lack support. These are natural things that are part and parcel of what happens in the Christian race. But the grace to obey is upon you today. I say the grace to obey his instructions are upon you today. Verse 19, let's read verse 19. This he, say, he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him what? He said to him what? Follow me. Those two words are very important. There are some instructions of Jesus that when you hear them, they may not be long. But as long as you obey, all your insurance and security is in them. The moment he said to Peter, follow me, Peter became a different disciple. It was not like the Peter that denied Christ a few days before anymore. This was the empowered Peter. This was the Peter that gathered the 120 in the, the, at the upper room in Jerusalem waiting for the Pentecost. That's a different man. Say that is a following man. Say that is a following man. Don't forget the first time he said to him, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He started to see how he was being taught to become fishers of men. When he was to go to the cross, he denied him. He slipped back. But when he said, now, follow me, he did not say, I will make you fishers of men anymore. Because you are already a fisher of men. You have now seen my miracles and my, you have testified to my power for fruitfulness. And so all you need to do now is to follow me. Hear what I say. Follow what I say. Keep doing what I say. It is the same Peter that Jesus said to on the water, come. And Peter stepped out of the boat. Remember? Peter knows that the instruction of the, mat, of the master may not be long, but as long as you follow, he will never leave you nor forsake you. In the name of Jesus, the day I discovered as a young person of 23 years old, 21 years old, just finishing my youth service in Nigeria, which we do after we graduate for one year, that as long as I am tithing my income to the things of God, that there is no way I will lack income. Since September 1990 till today, I have never at any one month lacked income. Never. I have changed jobs, moved countries, moved positions, changed work visa from student to, what do you call good day, permanent resident. <laughs> I have done all those things. Tier 2, tier 5, tier 1, <laughs> tier 4. That is what it is. Tier 4, tier 2. I have done all those things. Not one month, but no time. Have I ever been without giving? Till today, as I speak to you, I'm not boasting about it, but I am telling you some of if you hear some of the stories that, oh, there was a time I wanted to now do my, my father's burial and money was coming. It doesn't just happen like that. 
it is a place of following. You keep following, he keeps showing you. You keep following, he keeps showing you. Don't let the devil ever convince you that there is something else that these people do that they not tell you the truth. I don't take a dime from church money. Brother Joel is there. He's our chief accountant. When we finish the service, go and meet him. Say, print out the spreadsheet of all the spending of this church from 2013 to today. Or sister Fungwe. If I've ever taken a dime for myself to say, Brother Joel, I think I'm entitled to 5,000 pounds now. Enough is enough. <laughs> not once. Not once. We are not in this for, I'm not in this for making money. That is in this church for making money. No, I am here under a mandate to serve God and to work with him to raise a people who will be serving God, who will raise others who will be serving God. That is what keeps me going. And as I'm following in that mandate, I find him opening doors. Doors. I say doors. As he's opening those doors for me, he will be opening the same for you. In the name of Jesus. Just follow him. That is the empowerment for obedience. Follow him. The Bible says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. You, are, you, have, you know me, I talk my testimonies until you are very tired of hearing them. But I'll keep talking them anyway. This job that God gave me, that is a very supernatural leap from where I am to where he's taking me in a few days' time by the grace of God to start. I tell you, do you know it was sent to me? I did not see the advert. Somebody texted me. Oh, I said, David, this will be very good for you. I've looked at it very well, and I think you'll be qualified for this. When I looked at it, I said, you sure? I told the person, because the person is like a senior mentor to me. I said, are you sure? He said, you are very, very qualified for it. He said, go for it. Give it your full blast. You know why? Just a year before, I applied for the same position where I'm working now. They didn't even shortlist me for interview. <laughs> if they shortlisted me, maybe I would have had confidence again. So the fact that they didn't even shortlist me for interview and the same criteria that they wrote there, because in this country, if you have not noticed, job specifications are almost the same thing. Do you know that? Whether it is the NHS here or in, in the other place, it's the same thing. Or whether it is this university and that university, it's the same job spec. They will only put a little bit of slant for the specific institution. And I looked at it, and if I was to follow my flesh, I would say, no, I'm not applying for that to be, to be ridiculed again. I'll look for other things that are... <laughs> but as I obeyed God, as I went, I was surprised. The rest is history. I put out my stories and my testimonies before you because I don't want you to think I am not telling you everything. Only the secrets between me and my wife are my personal intimate things that I cannot share with you. There is nothing I cannot, everything you are hearing from me is my whole life. I have nothing to hide. Brethren, let's put hands on deck and serve this God. I have done it for 30 years. Nobody can convince me that it is a joke to serve God wholeheartedly. When you are committed to the things of God, you make it priority. I am surprised that believers will not go late to airport when they have flights, but they choose to come late to the things of God. Who is your priority? Let's be real. Even GP's appointment, people will not go late. Let's be real. If they say, if the council say your tax has now gone up to, you know, 100%, the next month you say direct debit, swipe it, take it. <laughs> but when it comes to the thing of God, you, 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 you give five pounds. It looks as if you have given 5,000. You say, oh, it's five pounds. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't be like that. Don't be like that. There was a time in church that I used to be before coming here. We're raising some funds for the new church building they wanted to buy. They are in it now. I told my wife that we're going to pledge something. We have never pledged money that amount. This is close to 10 years ago now, or about that 10 years ago. And somehow, God said, as I wrote the figure on a piece of paper, and I gave to her, somehow she said, that's exactly what I have in mind. I did, it was by faith. And I, as soon as we said it, and put it in the bowl. When they counted everything that was pledged, we discovered that our own pledge was one quarter of everything that was pledged in the place that day. Our own alone. The devil said to me, you see now, you have done yourself <laughs> overboard. If the whole church is pledging 75% and you alone, you, have, you want to carry 25%, you can see now. 
I said, I rebuke you, Satan, in Jesus' name. We said we'll do it over one year. Three months it was paid off. Three months. Three months. It is how far you want to believe God. We have been talking about this building for throughout this month, week, year now. I don't know who contributed what and who did not contribute. But you know something? These are the things. You want to go for, you want to build your own building? Build God's house. The house that I told you I built for my father, I told you how it is. I was sat here in this country. God used somebody to call me and involve me with a business. Before I knew it, money was coming in. I said, go and use it to build that place and let's put our parents there. I did not struggle for it. I don't struggle for things. You want God to change your lot this year. I am not, this is not a begging gimmick. This is part of me pouring out my life to you. I know God has gone ahead of me in the job he has opened up for me because that is what he has always done. Before I came to this country, he came ahead of me. I pray that as you commit to serving God that way, he will be opening doors for you. I say he will be opening doors for you in the name of Jesus. Final thing I would like to say is that he empowers us for focus and individuality. Some of these things could be very tough words, but you know something? Part of what we do in walking in love is having to speak truth one to another. But one thing I can tell you the truth is that as it is being declared, for as many that believe, grace is released. I say grace is released. Grace to perform is released in the name of Jesus. So do not worry. Do not worry. John chapter 21 verse 22. Jesus said to him, if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. You follow me. This is the last point I want to make. He empowers us for focus and individuality as kingdom citizens. He empowers us for focus and individuality as kingdom citizens. John was asking, Peter was asking, what about John, basically? And God said, what is that to you? This is what our believer generation must understand. My race is my race. Your race is your race. You need focus. When I look at you, I should not look at you to be criticizing you, but rather to be seeing in you, Christ, the hope of glory. So when I feel that you are falling short of that hope of glory, my job is to say, brother, come along. Like the Bible says, I should steer you up onto good works. You should also steer me up onto good works. This is our work. I shouldn't be looking at you and saying, why didn't you do this? Why did you do that? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why did you do that? No, 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 no. I shouldn't be looking at you to do that. I should look at you to say, this is what God is expecting of us. Let's get on with it. We can do better. When we steer one another up like that, I take responsibility for my own action and I encourage you to do yours. Then we see the results. You are a specific person in the things of God. That is why he said he has called us by name. When he wanted to say to Mary, he didn't say, oh, one of my disciples, one of my follow, uh, women followers. No, he said, Mary, Mary. And she said, Rabboni. That is how he's calling you by name. I said, that is how he's calling you by name. Amen. Your individuality should give, us, give you an assurance that he is concerned about the things that matter to you. He is concerned. He knows me. He knows my tomorrow. I've not been there, but he's been there. He knows who is going to oppose me tomorrow. He's already fighting it for me. That's why I'm relaxed. He knows. He knows. He knows. Before I came to this country, and he said to me, I'm taking you out of your home country. I got to this country one year later. This man who owns this property started to build it. By 2000, by the year I came, he started building. By 2001, they completed it. A year after I came to this country. He knows that 12 years later was going to be a place of habitation for his children. He knows. He knows. He has brought almost half a million in terms of our renting it and maintaining it in the last eight years to the glory of God. When we started, we didn't have 300 pounds. I paid the registration fee for, what do you call it, company's house. And that was it. Every other thing by faith, by faith, by faith. The first 5,000, the first 10,000, they asked us to pay 6,000 pounds deposit. He brought it. Before a, the first church member came here, all the seats you are looking at here were bought cash. 6,000 pounds before the first church member came here. The people who came here to pray in July saw that the chairs had already been delivered. He knows. Just follow him, follow him, follow him. And I want you to know that whatever good work he has started in your life, he will perfect it. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 
this is not all about money. The reason we use money a lot as an illustration is for us to understand the tangible things that usually concern us the most are even the things that God also is mindful of. Whatever it is in your life, as the fact that he knows, I believe God with you that he shall continue to perfect it. In the mighty name of Jesus, rise to your feet with me and let us pray.